we've been so I'm also an actor, by the way. And Rico and I, we met. Um, by the way, you can you can yeah. you can roll whenever. Yeah. Uh, Rico and I met. Um, I think 2006 or seven. Mm. Um, I moved. I was living in Vancouver, but I moved to LA, okay. and we went to an acting. Uh, I went to I think the act TV actor studio or something. Mm. And Rico had like a one one like an award. And, okay. And he was uh, sent. He could go to the TV actor studio, and <laughs> and that's how we met. We ended up living together. Oh. We were roommates for many years. Oh. Um, I was a groomsman at his wedding. Oh. We're very close. Very yes. close. Um, I love Enrique. Yeah, he's, he's a great just, guy. He's he's very talented. Just, he is very talented. He's yeah. just like and he's very smart, very talented, very. I got a lot of get up and go, and it just it, it was just between he and I don't know if you know his partner David. David, yeah, they, they actually they stayed with me when uh, when uh, when uh, the killing of Kenneth Chamberlain was opening in White Plains. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, the first time, not when it was. It, I think it was at a at a uh, the university. Yeah. It was. At a, and, were you there that day? I think so. Okay, because I. I think so. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, um, I was there for the, but all the times that they did it in White Plains, pretty much. Yeah. But one time they had three nights, and I think I missed one, one of the. Uh, I just only was able to make one, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they are just a great team. It's just. You know, just even, well, you know, with coming on board with them, it was just, because it was, you know, it's whenever you go into, you know, a low budget project, mm -hmm. you know, when you've been established in the business the industry, it's always a crapshoot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it can be good or it can be, you know, la, la, la. But yeah. I read this script, man, and I say, God, anybody who can, put together and coordinate around this script, they got to have something going. So I told my manager, I said, look, let's just go in with blinders on yeah. and, and trust and faith. And that's what it was. Yeah. The, I feel like, did you, did you, uh, did you know anything about the story before you did the Not film? Not a thing. Not a thing. Not a thing. Wow. And it's like, it's happened about an hour away from where I live. Mm. You know, and it's, it was very quick. They did this story. I mean, they did this thing happen and they pushed it underneath the carpet very quickly. They moved it along and it didn't get a lot of publicity. All those people, some people did know of it, you know, and but no, it didn't get any kind of big exposure. It was just mm -hmm. swept under the rug. Yeah. You know. And when you, when you read the script, um, is that when you knew that you wanted to do it? Oh, yeah. As soon as I read the first couple of pages, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it just grabbed me. Yeah. Something about it. I mean, the character, <clears throat> first of all, the character grabbed me. Mm -hmm. And then the story grabbed me. It was so compelling. I'm just, I, I it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And I just basically said, you know, I have to do this. I have to play this. Because you, as an, and that's the that's the in interesting thing about this whole situation is it's been, this is a true story and it's a film. Mm -hmm. And I gravitate and really move towards the challenge as an actor. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's sort of, it's complicated because it's a true story and you're telling a story that uh, that's so impactful mm -hmm. and has made me really a sort of a spokesman, a believer, a person who has to go out there and uh, promote social consciousness, which I've always tried to do my whole life right. and career anyway. But mm -hmm. this platform is like it's a it's a different kind. And so even when I tell people to watch the film, I'm just it's not one of those popcorn you know, soda pop drinking and eating affairs. You know, yeah. it's an event that is intense and it's compelling and it's, and, and and I'm thinking to say it's not for everybody, but that wouldn't be the right phrase to use because it yeah. should be for everybody. Everybody should see here. Sometimes we're, we're, we're presented with something that we don't want to deal with. We don't want to, and you know, we just want to just, I, I can't deal with that, you know, and a lot of people, even my family members, I mean, they had a hard time watching, watching this film. My daughters, they say, Dad, we watched it once. I, I, I can't watch it again. It's just too 
painful to watch. Yeah, just for people yeah. watching, I don't know. I don't know. The film is called the Kenne the Killing of Kenneth Chamberlain. Right. Um, it's a true story about Kenneth Chamberlain Sr. Right. I've also met Kenneth Chamberlain Jr., a wonderful guy. Oh, he um, is he's very... a great, great guy. Um, uh, but it's a it's an incredible story. It's online everywhere. You can rent it. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, you play Kenneth Chamberlain, who is just if you can tell us a little bit about Kenneth Chamberlain. Well, he is a he's a sixty seven year old senior um, who's living in a poor, you know, like a tenant like a um, tenant house, you know, and and um, it, it bespeaks what people think of you when you live in a place like that anyway. <clears throat> but anyway, he's he has some mental issues. He has he was a war veteran. Mm -hmm. Uh he um suffering a little bit of dementia dementia, PTSD. Is it PTSD? Mm -hmm. It's like from the war, uh some health issues. Right. And he um he basically is a man who he had he wore one of the medical alert systems, and it went off in his sleep. And the first uh, reactors were these renegade cops, I guess, who were untrained and undisciplined and unprepared to deal with this person because it, they're there, it's been said before, they're treating him like a criminal because of his environment where he lived and building, where there were drugs and maybe some prostitution and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, they're treating him like a criminal rather than a person who has health issues. Right. And um, so when they get there, you know, the his medical alert system went off accidentally. So when they get there, they want to get in and you know lay eyes on him, which is the which is the process protocol. Sorry about this. Oh, it's okay. I can't believe I have a phone going off. <laughs> it's it's okay. Someone saying, "Frankie, I'm not very good." With sorry, okay. I will be. I will put this on airplane mode. I think that that's what they do. Technology is not my strong suit, <laughs> as you well, as you just witnessed. All right. So anyway, they come to his home, and uh, he lets them know because he's spoken to the uh, medical alert people mm -hmm. that the thing went off in his sleep and he's fine. Right. And they want to get on the other side of his door. They want to get in his house. And your rights, constitutional rights, no one can unlawfully enter your home mm -hmm. without a search warrant or probable cause. Mm -hmm. And they had neither. Mm -hmm. And so they just, it becomes a 45 minute confrontation at the door mm -hmm. where they're just using everything that they can to. And in these old, it's like probably one of those old pre-war buildings with the steel doors. Those doors are really heavy and solid. Mm -hmm. It's hard to just break them down. You don't just. Yeah. And so he's, the confrontation ensues. And uh, it eventually ends with them finally getting through his door. And um, at this point, they are so irate and upset and angry because police, law enforcement people do not like to be challenged. Yeah. And it's like, basically, we knock on your door, you open that door, you let us in. And he was standing by his rights. And plus, he was hes a war veteran. I mean, you know, he was, I mean, but he's old now, and he's just not like he's proposed. Propo he's a threat. He's not going to, he's got no weapons. But they are, you know, he talks to himself, so they think that he maybe has someone in the apartment with him. And he assures mm -hmm. them, he cracks the door, lets them look inside, sort of, but they want to get inside. Yeah. And they're in, and it's uh, it's sad because there's all kinds of. If the police officers were properly trained, they would have taken advantage of some of the uh, positive aspects of the environment, like his nieces in the hallway, his son called, his, yes. you know, uh, they are right there, and their law enforcement's they are just basically like, you all stand back, get the hell out of the way, we're handling this. Yeah. And then it escalates to a point. One of the officers is uses the N word, and you know, and uh, it uh, it becomes very volatile. And uh, when they get in, yeah, you know what happened. Yeah, watching. I mean, watching the film is it's really really difficult to watch. Mm -hmm. But from as an artist sitting and watching it, it's done so well 
both all of the actors, the actors that play the cops, by the, by the end of the yeah. film, I, I hate them so yeah. much. Yeah. I have such hatred for those cops. Yeah. And then I'm like, man, those actors were so amazing to mm. make me just, I, I, I was disgusted with them. Yeah. But those, the acting was so strong on their part. You know, those guys did a really great job. And then you, you know, people are saying it's the performance of your career. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you feel about, about that? I, I don't even know. You don't I mean, know I'm just lost. In, I mean, you know, because... I've always, I mean, I've been doing this work for over 50 years, and I've always tried to give everything I have to every project that I, and every mm -hmm. project I do, I try to do a, 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 as good a job as I possibly can do. I think mm -hmm. that everything sort of came together. That's why people are saying this is a performance of, of my career, because it's, it's, it's intense. And it's Very like, intense, from, yeah. and it, um, and when you have to carry a film, I mean, you put in a different, you put in a different place as well. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I I know that it's um, it's one of the performances that stand out in my career, you know, especially in film because it's it like I say it was from the beginning to middle to end. I mean, I've done things where you've done good supporting roles and mm -hmm. stuff, and you know, you come in and you do work that's very intensive and and, and hopefully good. But this this has been. This has been unearthing in a way. It, I just have, like, I'm amazed at um, the power of this performance in this film. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I have no idea how I even got to do, got to those places except the way I usually get to places I do my work. Yeah. So let's speak about the work, actually. How do you prepare for something like that? Do you, um, did you, I don't know, a lot of people will, if they're, Let's say if somebody has to play somebody that's blind, they'll go and meet somebody that's mm. blind, speak to them, um, do a lot of research in that. How do you approach a character like Kenneth Chamberlain? Well, me, I've always been one of those actors who I don't like to do a lot of research. Okay. I don't. I think that um, because I like for everything to come to me fresh and new, mm -hmm. organic, spontaneous. I mean, you know, some things you do have to research, and that's okay, you know. But, you know, like I say, I'm in this world. I read, I see things. I'm very observant. My research is my eyes. Mm. I look, I'm looking at everything. I'm just, I can go to a place and I can tell you, like I'm into this room, I could probably close my eyes and tell you so much detailed information about it because I'm in here. And mm -hmm. I, that's that's my research uh, engine. But for this, I did not want, there is, there is um, lots of, um, information even hearing him speak as you yes. as you know uh, but i didn't want any of that i didn't want to know i didn't i didn't want to meet the family i didn't i wanted everything to come from the script which was beautifully amazingly written by david Medell, and it just spoke to me and i mm -hmm. said i know who this man is from these information that i'm given on the pages yeah. of this script and I use that, and pretty much, and I'm a very much a moment-to-moment -moment person. Mm -hmm. I don't try to pre-plan anything. Whatever happens, happens on the day. And the way we shot it, I just go deep into myself to find this guy, mm -hmm. to breathe him in, to breathe every aspect of him, every little nuance. And that's what I bring to the performance. Uh, of, or and um, that's, and it was intense because you, I was never able. This was shot in, a, in eight days, and it was like I never had a chance to come out of that. Yeah, I went into his, I went into Kenneth Chamberlain's world, his body, his mindset, and I stayed there. Mm -hmm. And I had to to do justice to this film because I wanted people to see the horrors of someone who is trapped in a small space with people outside who are supposedly sent there to protect you. Mm -hmm. Being the ones who are who are causing you mental anguish, mm -hmm. physical anguish, and all of that, so it was just it was pretty it was pretty easy to to get into the embodiment of this character. Mm -hmm. I've known people with uh, mental disorders. I've known people, you know, who. Um, who are, who are older and going through a little bit of dementia. I've observed them. I saw them, my father. And um, it was, those are the tools, the things that I use 
to find this character. And then afterwards, and I always tell people there are certain universal sounds that um, you no, know, if you pl if, if you listen to them and try to bring them to life in, in truth, they're going to all sound similar. Mm -hmm. And those sounds are sounds of fear, despair, anger, you know, anguish, mm -hmm. all of those things that were part of Kenneth Chamberlain of what he was going to he, mm -hmm. uh, going through, you know, the, the fact that he felt like uh, there was an injustice being perpetrated upon him, mm -hmm. the fact that he uh, did not he knew his rights, and the fact that he's crying out to any, you know, and he's like in and out also as well, you know, he's like crying out at one point, which is one of my favorite scenes in this is he reaches out, he cries out to President Obama. Yeah. He said, and that like oh, it tears my heart out. Me and too, it's yeah. like, and then it, later on he cries out to his mother. You yeah. know, you find these people and and when you get those sounds, no matter who's making them, if they're in, truly in a situation that they're um that they need to call upon those people, those sounds are gonna be similar. So I trusted that yeah. in, you know, in the work. Do you rehearse when you work on any role? Do you, uh, when you're on, like, let's say you're on set and you're, uh, let's say you're about to go on and you're working with another actor, mm -hmm. do you, does, do you usually pull them aside and say, let's run this a few times or, or how do, do you um, do anything like that? I prefer not to. Okay. I can. I mean, if it's something that, you know, you just want to, I mean, I'll go over lines and, <laughs> you know, then you, you explore, you find things there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course you do. Minimalistic rehearsal, depending on the project, whether it's film or TV, or they're, I mean, they hire you to come in and say your lines and not to bump into the front. <laughs> you Just know stand that over there and say your lines. Yeah, say your line, don't bump into the front, <laughs> you're fine. We're moving on because, you know, time is money, blah, blah, blah. But, um, but I'm, I've always been able to, um, you know, you, you run through it a few times, but it's not the kind of rehearsal you think of when you think of doing a play. Right. Usually, although sometimes, I mean, and, and you, you see, so it's um, it's an interesting process. Mm -hmm. But in this, since there was no other actor, you were alone in the room. <laughs> it was incredible. Me. Yeah. So it all came out of you know. I didn't when they you know I worked on the piece at home and you know just basically worked on the beats and moments as much as I could. And then when I got in the room with um, with David, yeah, I know. Uh, and you know we we would run through the sketch out the blocking what mm -hmm. it's going to be, and then you just say yeah, action sure. and you yeah. go. And I respond to the things that I was given, the voices outside. I never saw those faces anyway mm -hmm. coming through that door, penetrating voices and and the fear. It, everything was in his head. Mm -hmm. It's all about the demons that you hear, you know, the, that appear that come at you, you know, and. And disorientation. It's like, I mean, have you ever been in a situation where someone is trying to get to you, you know, when you're supposedly in a protected environment like your home or something? Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. Yeah. It's terrifying. I just uh, I just thought about that and I didn't need to. I know what that would, I can summons up the sense of what that would be like. Yeah, you know, the need and I to wouldn't... protect yourself and and your home and your you know, right. Also, the fear of the cops yeah. to somebody like him living in a place like that, all of that stuff, and also the dementia, yeah. uh, the PTSD. I mean, there's yeah. so many so many other factors involved. That it probably... is. It, they're all there, and they all like you know, they all. I was able to, you know, I, I really love the doing the work here because I was able to just really. Go to those places in my art and my creative process without interruption. And the director, David, was amazing. He let me <clears throat> just, you know, he would always, he would say something now and then, what he needed to say. Mm -hmm. But pretty much I'm I'm in the head of Kenneth Chamberlain and I'm waiting. It's like looking at that door over there. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for something to happen, waiting for the next knock, waiting for the next thing because I know it's out there and you don't that 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 enemy or that thing you don't see out there in the darkness is terrifying mm -hmm. because it's all in your head mm -hmm. you know and you don't know what you got an idea what it could be you know you don't want it to come in yeah and I god forbid I would never want anyone to have to be in that situation to go through that experience yeah it was... but as an acting exercise 
I tell you, it was so joyful and liberating. And, yeah. and you know, I just... Watching, watching you in that part, it felt like <clears throat> it must have been just being the actor on set every day. It must have, you must have not had any moment to be comfortable, it feels like, because yeah. Yeah. I'm uncomfortable watching it and you have to be that character, I'm presuming, yeah. all day on set. Because it, it must be hard yeah. to you get know. out and you come back come, in. You don't go in and out. You can't, that, you can't do it with that, with that yeah. character like that. So you, it must have been just all day oh, yeah. of, of Even of when you take a break, you know, you go up and eat lunch, you go up into your room, you're there, he's with you, that's who you are. And my wife, you know, she said a very interesting thing because she, she was there with me and... She says, I didn't know who you were for those eight days. Yeah. And the four days following, driving home, you know, she said, you were, you were, I looked at you and then Kenneth Chamberlain was there. That's who it was. And it's like, you never came out. Mm -hmm. Although I did come out because I had to go home, I had to go to sleep, I had to eat and <laughs> right. all that. But the good thing about being a such a low budget film, you know, we didn't have any high-end uh, facilities, you know, where nice, comfortable trailer where you could rest. Mine was in the, this room in this warehouse, you know. <laughs> yeah. It was cold and dirty and musty and all of those things. It helped. They lent it tremendously to, yeah. you know. And, and and in that situation, it was it was great. I mean, like, I, I lived with this guy for eight days. And um, even now, he's... I. He's right there in me. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't have to, every time I have an interview, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thrust back into that world. And, yeah. and I'm trying to, usually when I work as an actor, I can let a character go. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Chamberlain has been very difficult to let go. Part of it is because we've done so many interviews, you know, post-production um, interviews. Do you and, see any of yourself in him, maybe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe oh, that's yeah. Maybe, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, if I didn't see any of myself in him, I don't think that I could have done it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I mean, I know I'm a resourceful person. I know I'm a person who believes in right and wrong and, and believes in social justice. I, you know, I, I, I saw those elements about him. I know that I'm a caring person. I mean, it's just, you see it in his character from the, you know, when he's gone from total fear and disorientation and then he can get a phone call and he can speak so calmly and comforting to his daughter, his son, or the other person on the end. Mm -hmm. And then he's thrust right, he hangs up and he's thrust right back into this nightmare, horrible, horrible situation that he found himself in. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of Kenneth Chamberlain in me, I see. Mm -hmm. Not to the point of, you know, mm -hmm. of, uh, distraction like his was but it's like yeah i've had moments of this and that <laughs> when I, I i tell people all the time about this story um when i came to see it the first time at the university in white plains mm. it was in a classroom style setting and there was a projection screen and the film was put up on the projection screen for maybe a hundred people close friends of the family right people involved in the film, his attorneys. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about that day, I have never been in a room watching a film with a response. People were screaming, shouting obscenities, <laughs> swearing. The, the, the sound of... of Crying, I myself, mm -hmm. me, I was with my friend, my friend Lucy. We were sitting beside mm -hmm. each other. I mean, we were weeping, yeah. but the sound of people crying and screaming and and saying things and people getting up. I mean, I had never experienced anything yeah. like that in my life. I was like that. I knew at that moment I was like, wow, this is this is something profound. Yeah, because I had I've never I had never been in a room where a like a piece of work had mustered up so many emotions and mm. people watching it yeah. and people cared so deeply about it and it, it it has the same effect i watched it again at the theaters in white plains mm -hmm. um i was there and uh, we watched it over there with an audience there again it was very difficult for me to get through and watch to some of the parts are just like i'm like oh my god just 
And when you said he's fine, you just when you were talking about him, you're like you wanted people to go, he, he's fine. Mm. You say your character, Ken Chamberlain, says I'm fine. I don't know how many times in the film, but, they, but he says it maybe a hundred or something mm, like that. A, sure. a lot, a lot of times. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine, fine. I'm fine. Yeah. And it's it becomes kind of a theme throughout. Yeah. And then it circles back when the film is over. They play the audio, real audio from yeah. the event is played. Real audio was captured yeah, from the moment, and they play it. Uh, it's played back in the film, and he keeps over and over. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's harrowing. I mean, yeah. it's just like. Um, I mean, he uses a phrase. We didn't use it in the film. I almost kind of sometimes I wish we do it. Sometimes I listen. I hear where he says, uh, "Don't do that. Don't, don't do, do that. that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that." Don't yeah. do that. We substituted. I'm fine. I'm okay I'm from that. But just the way it's like, don't do that. It's don't do that. Don't do that. It There's something childlike resonates. about it. Yeah. There's something like yeah. a like a, a kid, like a, a baby would say, "Please don't do that. Don't do that. Don't yeah. do that." It's um, when I heard, I, I get exactly what you're saying. I felt like a uh, child saying, please don't do this to me. Don't yeah. do it. There was something very innocent about that phrase, don't do that. Yeah, And nobody that, listened to it. Yeah, nobody they didn't listened hear to it. it. Yeah. I mean, if somebody, if you're in a situation and somebody's doing something to you and you say, don't do that mm -hmm. enough, and then they don't hear it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a bad sign. It's one is showing that they're not listening. Mm -hmm. And they're not taking you in. And I think that, you know, those experiences that you felt and many audience members feel, they get outraged when they see this film, when they see this story, and they see what these police officers are doing, and they want it to stop. They say, no, it shouldn't be happening. And they can't control themselves, and it just keeps going on and on, gets deeper and deeper, and you see Kenneth Chamberlain just getting more and more agitated, getting more and more swallowed up by this situation and mm -hmm. it just i mean it breaking down his i mean he's lost he's like a child he's a lost he's a lost man mm -hmm. you know and it just i look at this film and i say well what could anyone have done differently because that's what my challenge is as an actor always that's a great question i'm saying ask. what could you have done that would maybe have given you a different result but um it uh I mean, he could have just opened the door and let them in. Could have. They would have whooped his ass and, you know, or slapped him around or something, but he would still be alive. Mm -hmm. But here's a man who is saying, I know my rights. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. Unlawful entry. You don't have a warrant. Mm -hmm. You know, you have no right to be in here. And I'm not going to let you in here. You can feel that way mm -hmm. if someone comes knocking at your door. Of course. You know, what would you do? Yeah. Police officers come knocking at your door in the middle of the night or any time, pretty much every ordinary person, citizen, will open the door and let them in mm -hmm. because they would be terrified not to. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that you have the right to say, who are you? What do you want? Do you, you know, do you have a warrant? Mm -hmm. No. Well, then you can't come. Go back and get a warrant and then come back. Mm -hmm. But none of this was done, and it just... Um, People, they, audiences are so great, man. They just, mm -hmm. they're so on top of this. But this is this film, and this is what happened in this situation. So you can't, they're angry because they say, well, this should have happened or that should have happened, but mm -hmm. it didn't. This mm -hmm. is the story that we're telling, and it's just. Uh, it's a wonderful film. I hope yeah. you, and you've been nominated for a Spirit Award, which yeah. is this weekend. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I really hope you win. Oh well, that would be amazing. I think I I think you should have been. I I told Rico though. I, I was shocked you weren't nominated for an Oscar. But I'm yeah, the, I'm I'm pretty sure there's a lot of politics behind uh, stuff well, like that. You know, all you know? of that's the thing about it is this film was made on such a small budget. Yeah, it costs most, money to be nominated. Yeah, most film. This film has not been seen. Yeah, people are not seeing it because they don't know about it. Yeah. The, everything we do, you know. To me, any kind of nominations would have been good to give exposure to the film mm -hmm. because the film is better than bigger than any award or Definitely. anything that I could ever receive. Definitely. I really am just uh, I am just so blessed, I feel, to have been able to portray this character and be a part of this film and to and to make people aware. Mm -hmm. Because they get to see something that they don't normally see. They get to see the victim, a black victim of uh, police um, injustice real time before he's 
before his demise. Yeah. You know, they get to see they get to see what this man is going through. I mean, a lot of times you see, you know, you see it at the end and then people come around and say, well, he was a good guy and he was great in the community. I'm surprised, you know, they're, but this, they're living with it and they're like, no, stop it, stop it. You got to stop it. You got to stop it. You got to, and it never stops. Yeah. It's called the killing of Kenneth Chamberlain. So you know when you go in there. Yeah. <laughs> that it's not going to be a good ending for him. Yeah, but you're still caught off guard, yeah. which is which is yeah. uh, you know uh, yeah. uh, which is wonderful. Uh, it just shows how good the direction was. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, David did a really great he job because you're still caught off guard by the end of it, and yeah. um, it's a wonderful film. You play a lot of. I, mean, I feel like this is going to be another one of you. You you do work on a lot of. You've been in a lot of iconic stuff. I um, do the right it. thing. Yeah. The Wire. One of. Probably most a lot of people will will consider it one of the greatest TV shows of all time. It's on a lot of people's list. Some people say yeah. Sopranos. Some people say this. But The Wire always comes up. How do you feel about being able to play all these iconic parts? And do are they? Do, is there any of them that you liked better than the other? Do you enjoy doing all of them? I enjoy doing them all. I'm mm -hmm. just. I was born to act, as they say. I, mean, I just mm -hmm. love acting. I love mm -hmm. to. I love storytelling. I love to take on iconic roles and iconic productions. I love things that have the message of a strong socially conscious message. I love things that make you laugh, that make you cry. I, I mean, I love it all. And I just, mm -hmm. and I've been blessed to have had a career that's been filled with these kinds of projects. I've never been bored a moment in my life. I've always gravitated towards from one thing to the next. And it just, um, I, I think the art of acting is something that is that is that has allowed me to live my life mm -hmm. because it's uh, it's it's so it's so important to me and actors are important to me uh, writers are important to me you know filmmakers theater mm -hmm. everything. So, yeah, I love. When, I I forget. I was watching something, another interview or something. But uh, we we are because of we're we're an acting site. We get mm -hmm. so many questions from actors that mm -hmm. say, "What do we do? How do I get started? All this kind of stuff." And a lot of times, the fr questions are very frustrating. First of all, they're very broad, and yeah. also you can tell that they, like someone's, "I want to act. How do I get an agent?" And they don't know. But I uh, in countless interview after interview, whenever you talk about acting, you very much stress the necessity of training. You, you talk about it a lot, and I love that yeah. because it is the single thing that I keep telling. I mean, I, I, as much as, I, I, as, much as information as, as I mm. do have, I can share, and I always tell people, get into class. Don't worry about managers. Don't worry about agents. You're so far from that right. yet if, it's, if you're right. even starting. Right. Um, but um, I know that you went to NYU. I did. Yeah. And um, what kind of training? If you could talk a little bit well, about my, training. Like I say, I knew I wanted to be an actor since I was about eight or nine years old and everything that I did, I used this preparation for a career, of, mm -hmm. you know, longevity of career. Um, and you said this thing about training. I mean, I just, whenever anyone speaks to me about wanting to be an actor, it's the first thing I say, you know, you, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, 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 you gotta have some, this is a profession, you know, it's not, like, you know, you want to be a doctor, so you can go out there and start operating on people and doing this. Mm -hmm. No, you got to, you, there are things you need to know. And it's the same thing with acting. I take it very, very seriously. I prepared intensely for about 15 years before I even did any professional work. I did uh, in high school, and did the, the drama club and all that stuff. And then I went off to undergraduate uh, to get a, a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting and Theater. Uh, Illinois Wesleyan University, and then after that, I gave committed myself three years to New York University School of the Arts. I, I heard that when you got when you got there, I, I saw another interview. You said you got there and you uh, <laughs> 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 you you said to the head of the department Shining that, moment. Yeah. that you, you were only going to give them a year because you wanted to yeah, go <laughs> because I was like, I mean, look, I had been I had been training, preparing, doing you know, summer, summer theater and everything for a long time. <laughs> right. And then I did four years of undergrad and I felt like, and I'm always getting the leading roles and getting, you know, everybody's showing a great deal of 
confidence and appreciation for my talent. Mm -hmm. So I felt like a big hot shot, you know, right. going into there. <laughs> and this little guy is um, he's not with us anymore. God rest his soul. He's um, his name was Lord Richardson. He was a really iconic person, especially as far as black artists are concerned. And but all artists, period. He's mm -hmm. the first. He uh, did brought a raisin to the raisin in the sun to Broadway, and oh. he goes back. I mean, Lord Richards was the person, and I got to study with this guy. He was the oh. head of the program at NYU. I walked in there. The little guy sitting behind me. That's not going. And I tell him, I said, "Look, <laughs> I break your face out, man. You know who I am. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm killing. I'm ready to go out there and make hay right now. I mean, people yeah. would be lucky to have me. Yeah. And he just very." very, uh, with a great deal of efficiency, he said, look, you see that door that you walked in? You can walk out because this is a three-year program yeah. and this is what you're going to have to do if you know to, if you want to be here. And I'm mm -hmm. like, whoa, this guy talking to me like that? Does he realize who I am? I blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But I stayed and I almost, like I tell people, I almost got kicked out the first year because I was so arrogant and I was so, and this is one thing that I want actors to understand you come into this business sometime, or you come into acting thinking that you want to be the best actor who ever lived. That was my that was my whole, mm -hmm. you know, channel of operation for myself. Mm -hmm. I said, I gotta be the best actor who ever Sidney Poitier, James Earl Jones, all those guys move aside. Frankie Faison is gonna be the best ever. And then training, throughout the training and working and collaboration, you learn that uh it, there is no such there is. thing as the best. Yeah. And I, many, many years ago, I saw, I mean, like way early in my career, mm -hmm. I changed that statement to, I want to be the best actor that I can be. Yeah. I want to give it everything that I have. And that was the thing that allowed me to be able to, to realize a career with some longevity because I just, and, you know, I don't want them to put me in a box. I want to be versatile. I mm -hmm. want to do all kinds of things. And um, that, that, that's a key. So don't, to the young actors out there listening, just know, right. do your work, right. do your, get your training, get some, whatever, yep. you know, everybody can't afford to go to some big school like NYU and pay, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, mm -hmm. but there are other places too, yeah. Yeah. wherever you can get some training before you set your foot out there and try to become quote unquote professional. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you might get stuck into being that same character your whole career. You might be very good at being yourself doing that. Okay. Right. And the industry will pay lots of money and they will give you a good career in that, but you won't have the longevity of career. Like I, I don't look at the overnight su successes. I look at the people who've been in it for 20, 30, 40 years onwards. Yeah, so. I remember I was working with my acting teacher, who's also a very well-known acting teacher these days. Um, and I was on stage in class and there was, you know, a big group and we were working on a very difficult, I think we were working on like Brilliant Traces or something by Cindy Lou Johnson. And, um, you know, it wasn't going as well as I wanted. Right. <laughs> but he said to me, he's like, look, Marshall, you can uh, you can book work. He's like you can be on TV every week. Mm -hmm. He's like you can. You, he's like he's like people will pay a lot of money for you to do what you got to do. But do you really want to be the best that you can be? Right. And so that goes back to the same thing that yeah. that you were saying. You know, yeah, you can maybe book work here and there, and uh, and and be on television, and mm -hmm. people will pay you money to be yourself. Mm -hmm. But um, how far do you want to be how able to go? You, and yeah, and that's that's the whole key because it's, and that's what the training will do. You mm -hmm. know. Because I knew when I came out of school, when I graduated from graduate school, I knew that uh, I, I, many times I walked into a room and I looked around the room and I saw people who looked like me, same physical, you know, qualities, and they were talented. I'm sure mm -hmm. that they were. And the only thing that I think that was able to distinguish me from uh, most of them or a lot of them it's a training. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew I had speech work, voice work, voice work. physical, you know, mm -hmm. physical, physical work, you know, and movement and no, those things they can, and you can hear it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can hear, you can tell when someone is trained and yes. when someone is not. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing is to be able to use that training 
to be able to have you transition to whatever you need to be. And I think that that certainly has been the key to my, my, my career and my life has been worth every ounce of training that I invested in it. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, something that was uh, your, you said your parents supported you um, in, in, in going into acting, even mm -hmm. though, you know, you came from a small town. Newport News, Virginia, there are many yeah. actors down there. Yeah. No theater. I mean, not really. And I didn't, but they supported me and they didn't know. They just basically said, look, this is what you want to do. Go do it. Good. You, 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 you'll be good at it because they had seen me work in church mm -hmm. plays and school plays and, you know, but they had no idea what you want to, this, this is your profession. And one day someone was at my house and they said, well, what's your backup plan? Mm -hmm. And my parents were so proud because I said to them, said to the person, I got no backup plan. This is what I'm going to do. This, this or nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I've lived my whole life. I mean, I've knock on wood, I've always been able to maintain myself and my family just from acting because mm -hmm. I refuse to do, I mean, I'm stubborn. I say, I don't want to be a waiter. I don't want to be a taxi cab driver. I don't want to, I don't, you know, and not that I find anything wrong with that because you've got to do whatever you got to do sir. to put money on the table to pay your bills, blah, blah, blah. But I was very, very stubborn and mm -hmm. I had a good support system, my family. Like if I'm down with no food in the cupboard, I could always call mom or dad, mm -hmm. my brother or somebody say, look, I ain't got no food. Can you got to loan me? I'm gonna hold a hundred dollars to get over this thing, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Until you know, but they all they, there was always that belief, you know. But also, I would stress to all actors out there: be versatile, mm -hmm. be versatile. Know how to do different disciplines, mm -hmm. like from film to television to theater to commercials to industrials to to speaking, whatever. But whatever you do to earn money, make sure it's something within your discipline, within your, within the, you know, acting can branch out to so many things that mm -hmm. you, so I always was able to, I was very fortunate to be able to do commercials and very fortunate to be able to do industrials, voiceovers, mm -hmm. theater, film, and TV. It just be as diverse as you possibly can be because then you have a better chance of, uh, always working surviving and surviving yeah that's you, know. you were talking about uh, james earl jones you mentioned him earlier i was on the way here i was reading an article online that they had the court theater just uh, they're naming it after him oh they're naming it the james yeah earl jones so oh, wow. now he's gonna have a broadway theater named yeah, after him and I, it should be yeah, and you and uh, you you looked up to him i, I he saw is, he was like m one of my mentors in so many ways just from just from Seeing him as an actor from afar and then getting to NYU, having him come in and direct me in a play. And then after that, understudying him on Broadway and then working at his, as uh, his brother in the great play Fences by the late great August Wilson. He won, directed a, he, by, won a, he won a Tony for that. I he think. won a Tony for that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and he also won one for the great white hope. Mm -hmm. And he's, um, I've worked with Jimmy on many occasions, and he was coming friend. to America. He was coming to America. Yeah. I, uh, uh, he's you're, you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> your part in that film is so hilarious, it, it, so it, it, hilarious, yeah. and I and uh, I think the story of how you got the part would be interesting for actors because I loved. I was actually telling Peter outside before you came in mm. what you said about when you go into an audition, you're not auditioning for that part. You're going in there to show people what you got because yeah. you never know what's going to come out of there. If you could, uh, if you could just tell uh, oh, how yeah. you got that part. There's no that. better case in point than this story coming to America. Of course, I mean you go in. I, I I used to always love to audition because it was an extension of my training. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to you know, like you out there professional nice. now. Yeah. You know, I can get a chance to do the have the kind of every day experiences working, you know, morning, noon, and night just on your craft. So mm -hmm. I, I would use auditions for that because I would want to go in. I'm competing for a role, but, but I'm also going in there to show people that I have talent, that I can do things. Mm -hmm. You may not want me for this, but maybe something else might come along down the road. You might say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. He was, he was pretty damn good. You know, maybe we should, you know, consider mm -hmm. him. And that happened in this. 
the great um, uh, John Landis, a film director, he had come to see Fences, which I was doing with James Earl Jones on Broadway, and we both ended up being in Coming to America. But anyway, he, James Earl Jones got a much larger role, and I was I went in initially for a very small part, just a guy, you know, because John Landis, he wanted some good actors in his film. Mm -hmm. And I went in for this small, very small part, which was one line, one day of shooting. But I got that. Mm -hmm. And then the actor who was, um, he, they decided they needed, they were looking for another person to play the role that John Amos played. I was too young for it, but I went McDowell. in. Yeah, McDowell. Yeah. McDowell. McDowell. Yeah. I went in and auditioned for that. And I mean, I went, I just let things fly. I mean, I was just at my best. I mean, I was just uninhibited and I was all over the place. And they were just like, wow. I mean, you know, I mean, they couldn't give me the role because I was too young mm -hmm. and I knew that. And sometimes that's going to happen to you. You're going to just be too young for a role. So um, I didn't get that. And I just figured I would just be doing my little one line. I was happy to be doing that, making a little bit. Good little bit of money. Mm -hmm. But then the uh, actor, uh, Bill Cobbs, who was designated to play the role of the landlord, mm -hmm. had another job. It conflicted. Can't be in two places at one time. I mean, I'd like, sometimes, you know, <laughs> lady luck is on your side. Yeah. So they remembered the work that I had done, that audition. Mm. And they said, they came, they called, and they offered me the role of the landlord. Nice. And I'm like, Wow, this is this is a nice juicy role, and I had no idea yeah. the impact it would have on me and my future and my career. Yeah. When I and, I and this is another story. A lot of times, I just um, people say, "Oh, Frankie Faison, on a comedian. He is so funny." <laughs> it used to just like oh, pierce me <laughs> deeply because I'm. Yeah. No, no, no. I am a classically trained actor. I'm a thespian. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I just did that show for some money. I just, uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, but pe I mean, people, they Comedy's embrace. Comedy's harder. Comedy's hard to do. You have to be very good to be able to be funny. You, you do. You really you do. Just, I mean, you got to be able to be very honest and very yeah. true and very much in the moment. Yeah, I know? mean, when you're screaming at the guy at you the know? ground, you're like, you're like, your rent yeah. is due. Don't be falling down. Yeah, yeah don't be <laughs> pulling that, falling down the stairs. Really <laughs> be conscious. But, you know, it's it became... I used to almost be ashamed that people were liking me in, in that because I'm saying you don't see the me. Yeah. I'm a, I'm an Othello. I'm a <laughs> I'm a King Lear. I'm a I'm a you know I'm a you know I'm death of a salesman. I'm a Willie Loman. Yeah. You know I'm not this this landlord with a cigar in his mouth. Thing, you know thing, you know. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. but I learned again another lesson. You live long enough. You learn a lot of lessons in life and in show business. I lived long enough to know that people really needed that comedy, that humor yeah. from this character and from the from the film itself. And they needed it. It made them laugh. It made them smile. And they weren't standing there judging me. They were just mm -hmm. appreciating the work that I had done. But it took me many years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And now I can embrace it. I can be... I can rejoice in the fact that I did that, mm -hmm. and, and I'm happy to be acknowledged for it whenever people do it. I'm a child of the 80s, so that film yeah. was huge. Like, I mean, I remember yeah. watching Coming to America. Eddie Murphy, just in general at that time, all the films he did, yeah, you know, they, were, they were so big. But yeah, I, that film was, was really big. Yeah. Like, when I, when I was young, I was watching it all the time. Oh, yeah. It was a great film. And it opened a lot of doors for me, you mm -hmm. know, just, you know. And like I said, I don't believe in overnight success. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe in you. That doesn't happen. You get your success through work and hard work and consistency in the work. Mm -hmm. But that film did. I mean, you know, it was, it put me, I put my face out there a bit and it led to other things, I'm, I'm sure. Did that come first or did Do the Right Thing come first? Uh, coming to America coming to first America. and then Do the Right Thing after. Do you think that helped you or did you, did you already know Spike Lee before Spike that? Lee knew me. Okay, <laughs> cool. From, oh, he also went to NYU. He went to NYU. Okay. And even when I did, when he cast me and do the right thing, he said, because uh, I was an upper class when he was, uh, he was in his first year, I was in my last year, I was leaving. He was, he came up, he, <laughs> on the day I remember, he said, uh, on the first day of um, filming, he says, you don't remember me at, at, at NYU, do you? Because Spike is kind of oh. shy. I said, no, I have no recollection of you at all. He <laughs> says, I told you. I, I said, one day, I'm going to put you in my movie. Mm -hmm. And here it is, right here. 
And he's like, for him, it was that moment of like, you know, acknowledging and keeping his word that he was going to do something. He actually did it. I say, yeah, okay, Spike, that's that's great. I mean, and Spike, I'm very proud of him. He's an iconic entity in this, you know, in this business. He's done amazing stuff. And so in here again, that you just never know. You just never know where something is going to come from or how. I may have so many stories of incidents of of someone not being available and you are next up in line and you, they can bring you on and, and things like that. So. Bill, Bill was here last, Bill Camp, we were talking about him, but yeah. he said the same thing. He yeah. said so many parts that he had gotten, it was somebody else falling yeah. through and he said it happens to him from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. I mean, it's uh, it, it happens and it's good and it just... You just don't want to be one of those guys on the other end of that where you, <laughs> you, just, yeah. you know, guy, I mean, I've had a guy, you know, who, who, who was, who was logged in to do a role on Broadway and he had a tragic accident uh, like a week before, mm. you know, and they had to replace, you know, find, anything can happen. So another thing to you guys out there, take care of your body and your mind, because if you're Great. not physically Great and advice. mentally connected, you you know, you looking at a very short, short time here in this as a professional mm -hmm. because you need to. I used my big joke was always I said, God, I'm, I'm not gonna have to worry about you know work. You know, I'm just gonna have to outlive everybody. Stay healthy. <laughs> you know, you stay healthy. I'll live right because then they get to the point. I say, we need an old guy. Who's left? <laughs> well, there's uh, ain't too many. You know. So that's why it's so very important. <laughs> I've always tried to do the best in taking care of my physical body. I was talking to an old friend of mine last night about that, an older actor. I said, like, you know, just stay, stay, stay alive. Home, stay, al stay alive. <laughs> stay alive. You'll put you somewhere, put you in the corner. <laughs> so we need an old guy to sit in the corner to just go. Blah, 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 blah. I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. You know, as long as I don't have to move or anything like that, I can just, I can do that thing. Yeah. So, but I mean, I'm saying jokingly, but you watch, look around, you know, and you see, look at the old actors that you see out there. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just to be able to land a good, solid role when you get older is, you mm -hmm. know, that's a blessing. Acting, you need all of your wits about you. You do. All of your senses you are, are, are operating at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, if, you're, yeah. if your mind and body is not working, you're going to have a very, you're very gonna, difficult time. Yeah. Unless they, hire you to do something like mm -hmm. I mentioned to you earlier, I'm doing this thing, playing this guy who has dementia, mm -hmm. space sheriff, he's like, you know, and they want him to be, you know, he's like, so they, you know, they can find some, I mean, I've worked with actors who they've had literally to just put in a chair and just tell them to look out and just say, hey, uh, something like that. And just, mm -hmm. they need all kinds of stuff. So mm -hmm. even when you get older and you lose a little bit of your mental facility, you still might. You still might be here. I've been on set with actors who just fall asleep. You know, <laughs> yeah. they just then they wake them up. Say, okay, go in there and do your. You know, yeah. it's, it's. I'm not. A, you know, I'm not advocating this. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I love the reason I love acting is I feel that you can go to your grave with your boots on. You know, nothing yeah. more glorious than to just drop dead on the set. You know, working at last scene. You know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Willie Loman. Mm -hmm. Have you ever have you ever did you ever do Twice, that? Twice, twice. You did uh, yeah. uh, here in New York. Not in New York. I did it. Um, I did it in a theater in New Jersey. Um, and let me tell you, it's like one of the most complete, well drawn out plays that I've ever. I mean, that's, I mean, it's I mean, one of the. I mean, it's one of my favorite plays of all time. Yeah. But that that role is quite possibly no. the most difficult in theater history to accomplish. I would I would say, I must I mean, be some sort of a freak. I don't know why, but I found <laughs> that role so easy to play. <laughs> wow, so approachable. I knew that guy. It was like, it's like Kenneth Chamberlain. I mean, yeah, when I stepped parts of him. History, the, the... I knew that. I knew that man, mm -hmm. and I connected to him. Just, I mean, I really do connect to these. Same thing with King Lear. I mm -hmm. got to do King Lear. And it just, I I think part of it is this. I grew up, my father was 50 when I was born. So I grew up with that respect and adulation for older, for the older generation. Mm -hmm. I always listened to them. I heard their words. I watched them because they were the people 
who were in my world from from birth. You know, my mm -hmm. father just, you know, he's he was like a grandfather. Mm -hmm. But I, and I saw those people. And so I just, when I think of people like Kenneth Chamberlain, I think of people like Lear and Willie Loman, you know, those kind of, I mean, those guys are just, they're so much a part of the fabric of who I am mm -hmm. that I find them very accessible to get to. Do you, um, the, the, um, the feeling of uselessness that Willie Loman feels and the, the fact that he is no longer, you know, able to be a man um, really right. in, in so many ways, his right. manhood is kind of gone, gone. is, 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 is uh, the, uh, is there, a, was there ever a time in your life that you felt like that, that you pulled from to ever, to ever? Oh, absolutely. Have... Being yeah. an actor gives you that, give you those resources because mm -hmm. every time you want to do something, you feel that you're so right to do and you put your, pour your heart and soul into it. And they say, no, we going that way. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I'm, I, I know that. I know that kind of rejection. Mm -hmm. I know that kind of sense of like, they don't need me anymore. Mm -hmm. they, and that's what ha that's what it is with Willie Loman. He, yeah. he, he is like, and he's so, he's got so much energy, such a desire to please and to mm -hmm. do. And they are just like, nope, your time has passed. Yeah. And I I feel that, you know, I can, I see that in a lot of my actor friends. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I, I don't let those kind of things get me down, but I do, I am aware of the fact that, uh, no, they don't need you, Frankie. They want someone younger. Or they want someone more famous or they want someone more of this. And I said, okay, well, that's too bad. And, and the statement when Willie Loman says, I'm worth more dead than I am alive. Mm. It haunts me personally all the time because I think of my family and I think of what would happen if I could not be a contributing person to society and the workforce and able to earn, you know, I'm like, I'm invaluable. My teacher, my acting teacher used to say, Willie Loman, Loman, his last name is Low Man. Yeah. Low Man. Right. He said there's there's so much meaning in that if you if you just look at it that way. See, I never see, I never incorporated that into any of my any of the times that I played him. But see, that's yeah. like, and that's the thing you got to always be know that you're gonna learn something <laughs> every day if you open up your heart, your mind. You hear something. I mean, that's and you never know where it's gonna come from. Yeah, no, he. I mean, there's so many, so much to do in, with names of characters and yeah, in plays. There's yeah. reason about why people name them. Uh, yeah. things is something that you learn all yeah, the time that's, but it's that's but crucial i mean that's i mean like i'm wow <laughs> i'm ready to go back with <laughs> coming to you low man oh uh, i, I, I wish i would love to see you do that i mean uh, are you are you working on any are you going to be doing any theater soon and i was come? supposed to be doing this two character play but one of the actors who was to co-star with me he became unavailable because of a film and they pushed it back but it's I I miss theater. I, oh, yeah. Theater is my heart and soul, my love, and I just no matter. And that's why I enjoyed doing Kenneth Chamberlain so much. It was like mm -hmm. doing theater as close as you possibly could get. Definitely, yeah. And uh, I just I just miss theater. I mean, I just I I I hope that this film, I mean, that this theater project will be able to be be realized. Mm -hmm. um, they pushed it back. Um, and we'll see, but yeah. it's um, it's called something. I think the title of the play was uh, "Some Old Black Man." It's, mm. it's his father and his son. That would be an eighty-two-year-old man and his sixty-two-year-old son, wow. and he has, you know, a bit of dementia, early dementia. And he, his son, brings him to live with him, and they talk, Beautiful. get to know each other. Father, I love any kind of relationship yeah. with pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, character-driven relationship, father-son, brother-brother, mm -hmm. brother-sister, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. brother-mother, anything, anything like yeah. that. Yeah. I just... Well, I hope that comes to fruition so we can come yeah, to Yeah, I would, would love nice. to. Yeah, I would love for people to... You'd yeah. invite you to come out. To <laughs> yeah, that. I would we love to. We could talk to. about that on your Definitely, show. Definitely, yeah. That you would know, be amazing. Which I congratulate you on because I think you're doing some amazing amazing work here it's just to expose 
you know, the acting community to these kinds of talks. And I hope that uh, there's something, you know, like I say, even whenever I do workshops, I talk to teach kids, you know, do acting workshops with young people who want to come into the profession. I just say, look, if there's anyone, like this thing, I got this low man from you today. <laughs> if any one thing that you can get from the conversation that can help you, mm -hmm. you know, in your endeavors, yeah, I feel it's worthwhile. And like I say, I I applaud. <laughs> we are actors, <laughs> thank you know, you. I in, in appreciate your work. So. Well, thank you for doing this. Um, you are up for the Spirit Award this this Spirit weekend Award on Sunday. Sunday. I, I really, really you hope know. you win. Um, yeah. The film Killing, Killing of Kenneth Chamberlain is amazing. Please, yeah. whoever's watching, go watch it. You can get it online anywhere. Yeah. Um, thank you, Frankie. You, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate hey, your time. I enjoyed the conversation. It just, it's always eye-opening, you know, to have a good conversation with someone. Thank so, you so much. Thank appreciate you for time. that. Thank you. Bye-bye.